Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Taylor Owen about his new book, Disruptive Power, The Crisis of the State in the Digital Age. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation and an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo. Every week, we're joined by an expert in international affairs, global governance, or international public policy here to the studio in Waterloo. Today, my guest is Dr. Taylor Owen. Dr. Owen is an assistant professor of digital media and global affairs at the University of British Columbia. He's also on the board of CG, and he's the author of a brand new book, Disruptive Power, The Crisis of the State in the Digital Age. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So Taylor, yeah. um, Let's begin by a you know, simple question. How are these new digital communications technologies disrupting states and international organizations? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess a good place to start is, is just the new capabilities that groups now have. And I think it used to be the case that in order to make large numbers of people do things and to enable collective action, right. you needed to have a large hierarchical command and control system. And that's why we built states in the industrial model we did. That's why industrialization developed the hierarchical corporate model. Because yep. you needed large command and control systems to make lots of people do things. And one of the main things that technology has done, I think, and this is particularly the case in the international space, is allowed people to mobilize, to communicate with each other, and to, and to influence the behavior of others in some ways right. that are both technologically enabled but also um, a challenge to those command and control institutions that, um, that used to hold power in the international system. Right. And you talk about disrupting yeah. power and yeah. that states are losing control. Yeah. Who's doing the disrupting? So in different, part of what I tried to do this book and, and, uh, is, is step back a little bit and look at different spheres of international affairs. Right. So very often what happens with this discussion about technology and, and politics is that there's a whole discourse, an academic discourse around development and technology, right? There's a huge right. discussion about ICTs and development and the history of technology and aid. And in the finance space, there's all sorts of conversations about cryptocurrencies. And in the activist space, there's conversations about the impact of digital activism and Twitter right. diplomacy, all this sort of stuff, right? right. The problem is, is they're all siloed within the discourses of those particular spaces. Okay. And what I want to do is step back a little bit and say, okay, who are interesting people doing interesting things across these different spaces, good or bad? And right. We can talk a bit about the good and the bad. Yeah. Um, and say, are there commonalities between them? So in the finance space, for example, I look at the rise of different cryptocurrencies and the different ways cryptocurrencies are being used, whether they be bitcoins or others, to either finance negative behavior in the international affairs space right. or positive. So, right. bit, and bitcoin's a great example. Bitcoin can be easily, easily can either be used to um, allow a migrant worker to send remittances back to their countries without get, having to pay 20% off the top f through a money right. transfer site. Um, or it can be used to fuel a site like Silk Road, which was a black market, or to allow terrorist organizations to transfer finances across borders, right? right? So there these, these tech, I, I wanted to identify groups that were using these technologies in the way that undermines state and institutional control. Right, and just on that, you know, could you make an argument that some of these disruptions are actually making our states and international organizations more accountable? because you know they now have to answer to these the citizen mobilization or yeah. or these other these other disruptive forces yeah i mean th th there's a lot of ways into that i mean i think in yes in some ways states are now having to justify their legitimacy right and their primacy as the fundamental actor in the international affairs space in a way they didn't before. Because before they were the de facto principal actor because nobody else could do what they were doing. Right. Now I think that's in many spaces that's less and less the case. So take something like the development space, for example, right? Or the aid space. Right. It used to be that when an earthquake happened, we needed the large state capacity, the heavy lift, the the information access that states had, the, the intelligence, the 
the access to big institutions like the Red Cross to deliver humanitarian assistance. Now, in some very real ways, we have mobil uh, a mobilization of citizenry via technology that's filling in some of those roles that the state right. used to be. Not all of them, right? Like, but it forces a conversation about what the state's good at and what network citizens are good at. And I think we have to have that conversation. So that's one form of accountability. Right. Another one is transparency, right? So one of the things that we can talk more about the Snowden stuff at length if you want, but the, one of the one of the things that's, that, that the information we now know because of Edward Snowden reveals is that um, a lot of this digital action by states was happening in secret. Right. Um, our elected officials didn't even know about it, and now we do. So to me, that's, I mean, that is now an, an act of accountability against government that we have, largely right. because of digital technology, right? So, so there's all sorts of ways into that, I think. And as states have lost control in yeah. you know, these various sectors, yeah. how have they responded yeah. to, uh, to this changing environment? Yeah, so I, th I think, so when I started this book, when I a way of describing this is, um, I started out as being a mapping exercise of people who are empowered by technology. Right. And one of the places that leads you is to an arms race between people and groups who are empowered by technology and states and institutions who are threatened by that technology and are seeking to push back or fight right. back, right? So in many cases, we have examples of this tit for tat between structural institutional powers and new networked actors, right? right? And they're both using similar technologies and they're going back and forth. So that was the narrative that was emerging. What happened when we learned what Edward Snowden released is I think we got a much clearer picture into both, one, how threatened the state actually was by this decentralization of power, and two, how they chose to respond to it. Right. And I think they chose to respond to it um, in a way that is kind of akin to traditional battlefield awareness theory or whatever, right? That like, right. The, the more you know about an enemy, the better your, the chance of your positive outcome in defeating them, right? The right. No, more you know about a battlefield in World War I, the better you will have in trench warfare, whatever it might be, right? right? I think that's the mentality that's guided their engagement online. That the more data we can collect, the more we can know the cyber, the sp cyber domain, the better our chances are of exerting our power on it will be. And that, to me, is the main precursor for these large-scale data collection efforts right. and these large-scale surveillance efforts. So I think the, the one thing that Edward Stone has really given us a window into is how the state has chosen to fight back against perceived empowered actors. And it's not just the state. I mean, one of the things I yeah, found really absolutely. fascinating about your book mm. is you talk about this, this relationship that's developed mm. between governments all around the world and companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So in many ways, this entire surveillance apparatus, or, or at many core aspects of it, um, have been enabled by a parallel process that was going on in, in, the, in the digital commerce world, which was essentially a business model that is drives most of Silicon Valley companies, which right. is that we as publics exchange um, our data and information about us in exchange for free services. Right. That's the model for Facebook, that's the model for Google Search, that's the model for, for, for most digital, di for Gmail. The reason we get Gmail for free is because they have access to it. Right. Right? They have access to it so they can plant ads inside it. That's the exchange we make. We've knowingly gone into, went into that bargain. Right. Now, if one is a state or other institution that wants to know a lot about populations for whatever good or bad reasons, I mean, there's lots right. of good reasons the state might want to know about illicit activity of its citizens. That's always been the case. They've always wanted to know that. But if one wanted to know that, this provides an incredible access point to a huge amount of information about society. Right. And we now know that, one, they had very sophisticated ways of breaking in to those databases and to those okay. communication channels. And two, they had a whole host of legal ways of forcing these companies to give that data. Right. And that's the backbone of the, of the surveillance state that we now know was, has, is be, has, been be, has been built over the last decade. And, and there is a direct relationship between the capacity that these corporations were building, the data we were willing to give to these corporations, and the surveillance capability the state now has. They're all related. And have these private companies 
kind of been dragged kicking and streaming? Yeah, this is a big unknown in all of this, right? So you, and it, it's, we know so little about that that it's really hard to sort of, to, right. to, to, to reflect on it. But, but we do know a few things. I mean, we do know that these large companies are increasingly getting into spaces and are expanding their businesses into spaces that are highly regulated by the government. Okay. They're building cars, they're building communications infrastructures, right? They're, yep. they're, they're stepping into the public domain in a way they weren't before. These aren't right. just small little startups. These are massive corporations who, who aren't nimble, aggressive, disruptive actors anymore, right? right. They're, they're large institutional actors. And it is not impossible to imagine a scenario where they would rather keep that relationship open than disclose to, the, to, to their users that the gov governments are pressuring them into providing more data than they're comfortable providing, right? right. Like that is not a scenario that's unimaginable. Right. So it's possible that's what happened. It's possible they knew nothing about it, um, but that the, the telecommunica various tele telecommunications regulations just allow government access, so many access points to where data is transferred overseas, across right. the transatlantic pipe uh, data lines, um, that that just gave governments enough access that, that corporations really couldn't do anything about. I, I, it's a real mystery in all of hmm. this. What we're now seeing is a lot of r rhetorical pushback from these corporations, and there's a whole host of networks that have emerged to, right. to, to lobby government against this type of surveillance activity, and the, and the behavior of some technology companies is changing quite significantly, whether it means you more protected sites that protect data of users better, whether it means end-to-end -end encryption on some email programs. But take something like take something like Google. Google does a whole host of things that are b b positive for internet freedom and right. for enabling people to communicate securely. And a whole they do a lot of work that's very positive in that space. Right. And yet Google, Gmail does not have end-to-end -end encryption. So the biggest single thing Google will probably do is provide this global email service and actually encrypt it properly. Right. Right. Now, they probably, they might do that, but they haven't yet. And they haven't yet because access to data is core to their business model. And, and that's a real challenge we face yeah. in this. Yeah. Now, are the states, is the state motivated to do this principally to deal with national security issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a provocative question, and they would say yes, but we know that's not the case. We know there's a whole host of industrial espionage that happens on the back of data that's collected right. through surveillance programs that are authorized under the pretense of counterterrorism operations. Right. Even in Canada, we know that's the case. We know right. our... We were spying on the Brazilian Ministry of Energy and Minerals, <laughs> right? And that was not for national security reasons. Right. It was for other reasons. Right. So, yeah, and that's always been the case. Espionage yeah. has always been used for multiple right. outcomes. Um, now, we've, uh, we've, we often have a pretense of distinguishing our spying programs from others right. in that we do this for pure national security interests or for counterterrorism purposes, but right. we know that's not the case. In the book, you talk about algorithmic violence. Mm. What, is, what does this term mean? So. Increasingly, with these huge amounts of data that are being collected by states and corporations, we need ways, or these institutions, any, anybody really, needs ways of making sense of them. Right. Um, massive databases in and of themselves are useless. And humans engaging directly with these massive databases are, are utterly ineffective at drawing meaning from them. They're just sure. too big. Yep. So the way we've gotten around that is by building incredibly complex algorithms, increasingly um, uh, artificial intelligence systems and machine learning systems that pull meaning out of these large data sets. Okay. So that's the, and that's the algorithm piece. So the, uh, these algorithms though, the challenge, with, there's two challenges with them. One, they're, they're increasingly unknowable. We don't, okay. they're incredibly complex algorithms that because of various artificial intelligence processes and machine learning processes are evolving constantly. Okay. So these are incredibly complex calculations that are drawing meaning and learning from data and, and evolving. So these, so these are very unaccountable things. So that's, that's the one piece. The second piece is that increasingly we're making governance decisions based on the output of those algorithms. Okay. So something, something as simple, example, for as predictive policing. 
municipal police forces are collecting data about previous violent acts, about movement of people, about various socioeconomic indicators, and deciding where they think, or determining from that, using right. an algorithm to determine where a, an act of violence might occur. Right? So that, right. it seems a relatively innocuous thing, but you have an act of governance built on top of an algorithm that we don't have a, a significant amount of accountability in. Right. So that's the, but I, I really do believe that's the tip of the iceberg. I think we're moving into a space where increasingly acts of violence are going to be driven, are going to be automated, and that's why we're having this big discussion sure. right now about robot war and that big yep. UN conversation that's happening right now. Yep. Is and it, it seems like science fiction, and a lot of people aren't engaged with this conversation yet. But if you project where some of this technology is going, we really are heading into a space of more and more ad automation in the conflict space, yep. more and more acts of violence that are driven, that are guided by very little, with le very little if n no human intervention, and a lot of this based on large databases and complex algorithms that we don't understand. So I, I, th I think we need to get our heads around this process as it's emerging. Well, and, and on a related point, I mean, one of the things I found fascinating about your book was that states are not you know, simply the targets of some of this mm. disruptive activity. Mm. They're actually engaging in some of the disruption right. themselves against other states. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we don't know a ton about it, but we do know that a whole host of cyber war capabilities are being developed inside governments and inside right. militaries. And, and, and that a lot of that is directed at other governments. Um, we also know it's directed at criminal organizations. And, right. Um, and, and the states will ultimately have a huge amount of power in this digital space, and do. Like, I right. don't want to, one, one sort of misreading of the book is that, is that I'm arguing that, that governments are going to lose this fight. Right. And I'm not. Governments are no. still the dominant actor in the international system, and they have a massive amount of power. The problem with government's disruptive actions in this space, though, is that governments are bound by a different set of, res of restrictions and norms than other disruptive actors. We, they, have, there's a, they are bound by democratic norms, by right. legal restrictions, by various aspects of transparency, by general norms of behavior in the international system. Right. And many of the things they do, I think, start to really push against the bounds of those norms right. in ways that, are, that could ultimately get them in trouble. Um, and so, so they can do disruptive acts, but they're act and they're very powerful when they do do them, but they can backfire very easily. And, and a good example of this is, is um, the uh, U.S. government setting up a fake version of Twitter in Cuba to try and foster dissent. Okay. So they built this entire clandestine program to right. build a, a fake company, a shell company that would launch from Latin America into, into, into Cuba and be a text-based messaging version of Twitter inside Cuba. And it actually got up and going, and it was running, and there were 40,000 users inside Cuba. Wow. And then it was found out. Right? No big surprise, right? Like yep. This was found out. And the program was developed by USAID, a, a, a ostensibly an aid organization. So all of a sudden, USAID, which is bound by different norms right. than a clandestine CIA program doing this kind of pro thing, is affected, and their programs are affected around the world. Right. So there's like there's a blowback against the kind of behavior against states that other organizations might not face. Well, and in, in, in the book, you talk about discussions that are taking place to essentially create multiple mm. internets yeah. for the world. That each mm. region would have its essentially right. its own internet. What is the rationale yeah. for this? So there are many. Is the right. answer. Okay. Um, People call this splinternet, so that right. this, uh, this idea of one common global internet where everybody has access to and there's one body of data that's connected um, is arguably already gone. We have large pockets of the internet that are controlled by states in ways that are re restricted in various very significant ways. Right. But we have a few other things going on. One, uh, one there's a movement towards... Um, private mesh networks okay. that are emerging, and this is, these are being tests. Uh, some of them are being funded by the U.S. government. They're being deployed in in places in inner cities that might not have access to the internet, and they're private networks that allow people to be connected with each other. Okay. But they're also being deployed for activists and 
in conflict zones where right. they might not want to be surveilled, right? They're where they can't be. Sur they're trying to protect themselves against surveillance. So, so that's going on. We have national governments that want to have their own internets. So we have China with a very restricted internet. Sure. We have Russia that want, has said they want to build their own internet, right? Because the internet is perceived as a American experiment. Right? Yep. So there's that going on. But then there's also a reaction to what we now know about the US surveillance program. So Brazil has said, we actually don't want our data going through the United States. We're right. going to build our own data lines to Europe and Asia, as opposed to them going to the United States to avoid this capture of data in the United States. So there's all sorts of pressures, I think, on right. this system. And then there's, I think there's more and more people who are aware of the way their data is being used and aware of the amount of access governments, whether our own or others, have to our data. They would likely be open to different forms of internet, that maybe right. an internet that has a higher degree of security built into it. Right. Um, and, and so I think we're going to see those, those the, I think we're going to see those emerge. So we may be in an, in a, in an era in the next decade where multiple versions of, inter, of various internets emerge. And, right. and that some of them might be good, some of them might be very negative. Um, but it is a shame that we might lose this idea of a common global information system that everybody is a part of. And to me, that ultimately, yeah. that's a loss. So what needs to happen then? in order for us to reap the benefits of these disruptive technologies yeah. without descending into chaos or splintered uh, regionalism when it comes to, to yeah. the internet? Well, I mean, ultimately I think w states need to do a few things um, because they are the dominant actors in the system. Right. I think states need to merge, f to shift focus from seeking to, um, seeking to control the internet to seeking to protect what makes, what empowers people on it. Right. And this has multiple angles. They, I think they need to scale back surveillance activities because I think there's a real risk. Their desire to control the internet has the real risk of breaking it. Right. Um, so they need to scale back that. I think they need to learn from actors that are doing positive things in this digital space. There are a whole host of actors who are enablers of the very things states are trying to do. Yeah. They're enablers of free speech. They're enablers of civil liberties. They're enablers of economic development. Yep. These are all very good things and things that the state is designed to promote, right? The, yep. the Western democratic state is designed to promote. So why aren't we actively engaging with these groups? Um, so that's another thing. I think they need to do th the core, they need to step back from some of the initiatives that really f threaten the foundation of the internet. So um, when it was revealed that, that governments have been trying to break encryption, for example, right. Things like that, that touch on the very foundation, the technological foundations of the internet, they need to step away from because the risks are too high of breaking it. Right. And then I think, finally, they just need to, there needs to be a willingness to reimagine what the international system looks like okay. in an age where individuals and groups have significantly more power than they did when the institutions that govern our system were created. When the international system was developed, states and large hierarchical institutions were the dominant actors. And that's why our institutions are built the way they are. But what would it mean to have a group like Anonymous or a group like Telecomics, which I talk right. about in the book, which does all sorts of positive things to enable empowerment online? What if they were brought into the, in our international institutions? What would that look like? Wow. And, and I don't know, we, I mean, we don't know the answer to that, right? And, and it would probably look really messy and it would probably backfire in all sorts of ways. Right. But if we're not having that conversation, then we're excluding them from the international discourse. And to me, that's just a recipe for escalating this. Yeah. Taylor, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you, you so much for being on the show. Yeah, and thanks for having congratulations me. Congratulations on the book. Thanks so much. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.